this story happened back in 2016. I was 18 and was planning on visiting my girlfriend. We lived in different cities in the UK, so I decided to get a train and visit her for the weekend. The train I caught was slightly earlier than I had booked, but some UK trains have the option for more flexible times, as long as it isn't at rush hour. It was 5am in winter. It was cold, dark and miserable, and I had just stepped onto the platform to wait for it to pull up to the station when a roughly 60 year old man came and stood next to me. By next to me, I mean he was literally less than 20 centimeters away and practically leaning on me despite almost no one else being around, so it's not like the area was cramped. He was balding and wore thick rimmed glasses with incredibly strong prescriptions by the look of it. He was significantly taller than me too. I'd say he was close to six foot six, but slim and gaunt, with coarse graying skin, and had an unusually wide mouth and a scraggly beard that looked like it needed a good trim. He was dressed in a black baggy hoodie that was pulled over his head, and wore fatigued jeans that looked as if they were close to falling apart at any moment. I stepped away, trying to politely put some distance between us, and fortunately he didn't follow me any further. When the train pulled up and I stepped onto the carriage, found a seat, for reference I sat on the left side of the train next to the window, put my headphones in, and tried to nap for the duration of my three hour journey. When the train was mainly empty, a few tired workers slumped in the corner, sleeping off the work from the night before and a couple of old women chatted quietly amongst themselves. The journey was mostly painless, and I had mainly forgotten the old man, and couldn't see him in either my carriage or the ones adjacent, so I paid the thought of him little attention. It was about an hour into the journey, when the train went into a short tunnel. It couldn't have been for more than twenty seconds, but I felt a strong hand grab my right leg. I jerked out of my dazed, half-asleep state, only to find that as the train exited the darkness, the old man was sat directly next to me, still grasping my leg hard enough that it would later leave a light bruise along the thigh. I pulled my leg away, and quickly asked him what he thought he was doing. I'm not an intimidating person. A pretty fat teenager that barely reaches five foot eight is never going to be a scary sight, but I put on my most confident and authoritative voice, and repeated my question, though this time it was louder and contained a few more choice words for the odd man. I had barely managed to finish the question before he grabbed my face with his hand and slammed my head against the window so that I was pinned in place. Despite my struggles, he easily held me in place and leaned in until he was only a few inches from my squished face. With a deep baritone voice that seemed to echo around in my brain, he whispered directly into my ear something similar to, you would be a very nice plaything. I apologize that I can't remember the exact words. The adrenaline that had me freaking out made it difficult to concentrate on things like that. But I vividly remember that he knew my name. He then licked the exposed side of my face slowly, until a bridge above the tracks blocked what little light was trickling into the carriage. As the light dimmed, I felt the hand release my face, and I snapped to look at where the man had been sitting but he had already disappeared from my view. I rose shakily from my seat and rushed to the toilet to vomit from fear. I stayed in there for over an hour before an inspector knocked on the door to check my ticket. I informed him what had happened, and he escorted me to police officers at the next station who swept the entire train for the man. It was treated as an assault, so the police viewed the CCTV from the train, but were unable to identify the old man. I nearly broke down into a panic when they said they couldn't find him, but that wasn't even the worst part. When the police later viewed the CCTV that covered the route I took to reach the train station, they stated that the same tall, black hooded man could be seen following me for almost two miles, starting from just outside my house. To this day, I refuse to return to that city. I moved away about two months later, and have made a promise to myself that I will never ride a train again. About 25 years ago, when I was in middle school, 7th grade, 
I had a real bad problem with bullies. I couldn't handle the ridiculing I took while riding the school bus, so I started walking three miles to and from school every day. The path I walked was pretty safe, mostly on a sidewalk, and always on a busy road with the last 2.5 miles being a straight shot directly to the school. Back then, there wasn't a stigma attached to kids being outside on their own, so this wasn't deemed unsafe or noticed by anyone, or so I thought. I lived alone with my father, parents being divorced, and my mother saw me on the weekends. He didn't see any harm in the walking, and my mother wasn't aware of the bullying or the walking, since I didn't want her to know. So I continued unimpeded for over half of the school year. No, I wasn't really an active kid, and I sure didn't like having to walk six miles every school day, so I assumed this was the motivation for the error I was about to make. One day on the way home, a car pulled up on the shoulder and stopped about a hundred feet ahead of me. That car looks familiar. Hey, it's my father. He's going to drive me the rest of the way. I started to jog up to the car, seeing him in the driver's seat, waiting patiently. Huh, his hair looks darker than normal today. Wasn't the inside of the car tan, not red? The thoughts left as soon as they entered and I caught up to the car, opened the passenger side door, and started to get in. As I was tossing my backpack on the floor in front of me, and swinging my legs into the car, I started saying, Thanks, Dad! But the sentence never completed. Before I knew it, I had shut the car door and we began to move. This isn't my father. This man was much older, by at least twenty years, hair obviously dyed black, and hands propped at ten and two on the steering wheel. And the shirt he was wearing looked just like one my father would have worn. A short-sleeved collared button-down, brick red with black horizontal lines, not pressed but not too wrinkled either. He was smiling at me, which probably would have felt warm if it was coming from my grandfather, but here it felt menacing. I heard a click, and looked over at the door which had just been locked. I stared at the door for a moment longer, then turned and faced front, and completely froze, terrified. What do I do now? Hello. I saw you walking. I figured I'd give you a lift. I didn't move or answer. Don't act scared. Just act normal. His voice matched his smile, deceivingly friendly. We were roughly a mile away from home, and a half mile from the next turn needed to head in that direction. All I could concentrate on is how I was going to get myself out of the situation. Stay calm. Don't act scared. Are you on your way home? This snapped me out of my little zone. Home, yes. I want to go home, I answered. Where's your house? I can take you there. Feeling just slightly relieved, I told him to take the next right turn. I felt myself begin to breathe and realized how tense I had been. My body relaxed slightly, and I finally moved and wrapped my hands around my backpack straps. See? Things are fine. You're fine. Keep calm and you'll get home. We started to come up on the intersection, and I pointed ahead, reiterating that this was my turn. Okay, but if you want, we could take a ride instead. It sounded like a question, but it didn't feel like one. The dotted line for the turn lane had begun but he did not get over. Instantly I tensed back up, and my grip and my gaze on the backpack straps tightened. Through strained muscles, I choked out that no, I really needed to get back home. He swung the car into the turn lane and began to make the turn. Wide-eyed, I glanced up and verified that yes, indeed we were making the turn. Okay, see? Everything's going to be fine. He's taking you home. Are you sure? I'll make sure you get home before anyone realizes you're gone. Grip tightening further, I abruptly stated that no, I needed to get home now. My father was expecting me, and he was waiting. I just hoped it sounded more convincing to him than it did to me. We completed the turn. <sighs> okay, maybe next time. We can meet at the same place tomorrow? Sure, yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow was good, 
I just need to get home today, now. Maybe it was actually convincing. My eyes were firmly trained on the road ahead of us, hoping that if I just focused on the direction to home, I would get there eventually. The turn into my neighborhood was approaching, and I informed him, again pointing towards the direction. The direction home. The next few moments were silent, even if it was loud in my head. As we came upon the turn, I reminded him, and to my slight surprise and incredible relief, he made the turn. For the first time, I had more hope than doubt. Oh, oh no. He can't know where I live. What should I... You know, it's probably not a good idea that I drop you off right at your house. Your dad might see me and get mad that I gave you a ride home, and that we wouldn't be able to meet tomorrow. I was able to appreciate the good fortune of my silent question being answered for me. My old neighborhood consisted of mainly apartments, but in the back were a block of townhouses, which is where I lived. If you were unaware of the layout of the complex, the townhouses might go unnoticed. Right before we got to the area where I lived, I told him here and to stop here. He pulled over to the side of the road in front of an apartment building. He unlocked the door, and I hurried out of the car, backpack still in hand. I began to close the door behind me. See you here, tomorrow, same time? I paused for just a second and risked another look at the man, still smiling, still terrifying. Yes, tomorrow. See you later. I finished closing the door and hurried off. I swung my backpack on the right way and briskly walked in the opposite direction of my house. I could hear the car still idling behind me, and it wasn't until I was able to turn off that road and leave his view that I heard him start to move. He had to drive up to where I was walking to turn around, and I glanced back as he was making an awkward turn instead of going around the block to leave. He caught my gaze and gave a slight wave before finally driving off. My hand was in the reluctant process of waving back, but I was slow enough that he was gone before I completed the motion. I turned my head and kept walking, and the moment I could no longer hear his car, I ran as fast as my pudgy legs and heavy backpack would let me. I ran around to where I could hide between two buildings and hid there for a while until I felt enough time had passed for me to feel confident he wasn't driving around waiting for me. It was probably around 30 minutes, but it felt like hours to me at the time. I ran the rest of the way home keeping a lookout, making sure he couldn't see me through the backyards. I reached my front door, unlocked it, and almost spilled inside I was moving so fast. It wasn't until I locked the door behind me that I felt safe. I didn't feel scared anymore. I was home. And I couldn't believe it. In the end, I told both of my parents, and my mother forced my father to drive and pick me up from school for the remainder of the school year. Luckily for me, the bullying stopped the next year. My father didn't believe me, and thought I made up the story to get out of walking to school. In his defense, me trying to explain that no, the car was exactly like yours except the entire color of the inside, and no, he did look like you, just with darker hair, and it all happened so fast and, well, it didn't matter. It was worth his disbelief and annoyance every day in the car, so I never had to meet with that guy again. Hi all. As usual, long-time worker that finally built up the courage to post about something that had my whole family shaken for years. I may not be able to tell the whole story, since it spanned over a long time period, but I will give some of the craziest happenings. If you're interested in hearing more about the story, I would definitely post a follow-up. Anyways, on to the actual story itself. So I live in a suburban neighborhood, surrounding a very affluent city. Many of the people who lived in my neighborhood were either big business workers, engineers, or medical professionals. I was about 15 at the time the craziness started happening, and my younger brother was still in middle school. I lived on a cul-de-sac with other families who have kids around my age. Directly across the street lived a man, let's call him Bass for the sake of privacy, his wife and young daughter. Bass was an engineer for a local company and was very friendly for the first year he lived across from us. We invited him and his family to our cookouts and neighborhood gatherings, because at the time he seemed like a normal guy. 
Well, here's when things started to go south. Somewhere along the line, people in our circle began to see some strange things happening at Bass's house. The lawn was never cut, the pool wasn't cleaned, and we wouldn't see his wife or daughter leave the house for quite a while. We would see Bass drive off in his sports car, but his family was never with him. It turns out he had some sort of mental break and threatened his wife with a gun while he was intoxicated, saying that he was going to hurt himself. His wife and daughter were traumatized and immediately got the hell out of there. During a freezing winter night, I woke up to the sounds of police cars, fire trucks, and ambulances. Considering I live in a small neighborhood, I rarely see any emergency vehicles in our area. Maybe the occasional cough or a noise complaint from our older neighbors, but that's about it. It was probably around 2 in the morning, so I groggily went to my window to see what was going on. My heart immediately sank. Bass, our neighbor, had gotten drunk again and purposely buried himself in a snowbank naked, and was refusing help from the authorities. We all felt terrible for him, because he was such a nice man when we met him, but somewhere along the way he just broke. His drinking problem had gotten way out of hand, to the point where he lost his job and his license due to multiple DWIs. I was home alone, babysitting my brother and the next door neighbor because both of our parents worked and my brother was good friends with the neighbor kid. A cop pulled up to our house around lunchtime, saying that Bass had taken a car, drove it around our neighborhood at alarmingly fast speeds, and was possibly armed because he was arrested for owning unregistered weapons prior. Apparently, he heard that the cops were coming, because many neighbors complained. He ditched the car, and was last seen wandering through the woods behind my house by the people who lived down the road from us. You know that feeling when you reach into your pocket to find something, and it's not there? That stomach-dropping sensation? I had that feeling times about a thousand. The cops said that if I saw him go back to his house, to call them immediately, as they have no idea where he's wandered off to now. After the cop left, I went into panic mode. I locked all the windows and doors, and informed my brother and the neighbor to call the parents and tell them the situation since they were still at work. An hour passed, and my brother and my neighbor are just sitting in the living room watching TV, and I'm in the dining room in front of the house keeping watch. I notice some of the trees on our side yard are moving, as if someone is trying to push through them. I informed my brother and the neighbor to get out of sight of the windows and stay quiet. As soon as I say that, I see Bass stick his head out of the trees, spot me in the window, and run back through the woods. I immediately call the cops freaking out, saying that he's still in the woods hiding and saw that I was home. Bass knows what my parents' cars look like, and since they weren't in the driveway, I'm sure he knew I was home alone. I was relieved he was back in the woods but at the same time not knowing exactly where he is freaked me out even more. For the hour following my call to the cops, no sign of Bass, until he appeared in my backyard walking out of the woods. I was freaking out, because the only thing keeping me from the outside was a sliding glass door. I was in the kitchen, and ducked behind a countertop. I peeked my head up, and saw that he was looking at my door from about twenty feet back, just staring and not moving. After about ten minutes, he ran to the front yard, and that's when I noticed he did have something in his pocket. I wasn't sure exactly what it was, but he kept his hand close to it while going into the road, and locking himself back in his garage. The cops came, but since he was back on his property, and had no evidence other than the neighbor's account of him driving through the neighborhood, they really couldn't do anything except give him a warning. Basically, it was our word against his at that point. Years go on, and he makes the dive into complete psycho, locking himself in the garage in his car running the exhaust. He stocked up large propane tanks, and planned to light a match completely blowing the place up. Luckily his next door neighbor smelled the gas, and called the cops and the fire department immediately, went in full hazmat suits to retrieve him from the garage. The final straw was when I woke up again in the middle of the night to moaning. It sounded so close to me that I thought someone was in the house. At first I screamed, hoping my parents would run in to beat up whoever it was in the house, but as they busted in my room, they realized it wasn't coming from inside, it was coming from outside. I slowly peeked through my blinds, 
to see Bass lying on the road in front of our house, just groaning and singing, but it was just incoherent. My dad stormed out of the house while I was screaming to him to tell him to come back. He told Bass that he better go back home, or we'll have the cops come again. Of course, Bass got confrontational and threatened my father, telling him that he should watch out. He proceeded to just go back to the middle of the road and lay down, but in silence. My dad had enough, so he came in and slammed the door and locked it, and told me to go to bed. I didn't get any sleep that night. During junior year, he ended up just randomly disappearing. Some people said he got put in a mental ward. Some said he finally got put in jail for a long time. And then there was the idea that his mother came and took him out of state. The house is still empty to this day, and I still live in the same house myself. The younger neighborhood kids sometimes go explore his yard at night, because it definitely wasn't kept up nicely when he lived there, and it's not getting any attention now, so it's pretty spooky looking. But I'm just glad I can finally go to sleep at that house, knowing that Bass won't be terrorizing the neighborhood anymore.